to Mexico, in Mexico City, and then came to the United States where he got his PhD at Duke, and then after completing the work at Duke, he went on and worked at the National Institute of Environmental <coughs> Health and Sciences, which is in Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, where he was a NIH and IRTA postdoctoral fellow with Thomas Dart. Um, he joined the faculty at Wayne State University, in 2009 and has been recently uh, tenured and promoted to associate professor. Um, over this short period of time, he's already won a couple of, uh, uh, of awards, both in terms of uh, in science awards as well as at uh, Wayne State University. He was the Dell Intel Young Investigator Award of, at the 54th Sanibel Symposium and Quantum Theory Project. And he also was uh, got an excellence in teaching award from the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at Wayne State. So uh, uh, I'm sure we're all interested in hearing today about his research, which he's going to talk about on insights on DNA repair enzymes from computational simulations. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Feigerly for the invitation. It's been a really great visit. And it's good to see some old friends and great to meet some new ones. It's been a very, um, very pleasant visit and I've learned a lot and I hope that I can repay the favor and hopefully I can tell you, uh, you'll find what we've been uh, enjoying doing for the last six years interesting. So um, I generally like to start at the end just in case I run out of time. Um, so let me tell you uh, about uh, a little bit about our uh, group. The work that I'm going to tell you about today was mainly done by the first two grad students in my group, Dong Fang and uh, Rebecca Sweat, who are not in the picture. But um, Dong Fang is now a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin with uh, Q, uh, QC, uh, Chang Sui. And Rebecca Sweat was just uh, recently hired as a computational chemist at Vertex, which uh, is really cool. I'm excited for her. Um, I'll tell you a little bit of work uh, that has been uh, done also by Eric who's a postdoc in my group and is uh, currently searching. Um, and a lot of the work uh, that I'll discuss was done in collaboration with uh, Jean-Philippe uh, Picmal uh, and Tom Darden and a little bit with uh, Peng Yu Ren. Funding from NIH is gratefully acknowledged and Wayne State and also uh, computing time from Wayne State is, uh, was instrumental. Okay, so before I go on, let me, uh, if you guys uh, haven't been to Detroit, I don't blame you. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> there's one, uh, one bright spot about Detroit. There are several, but one very bright spot is it has the Detroit Institute of Arts, which we still have thanks to uh, some uh, private and uh, uh, public donors. Um, and in the Detroit Institute of Arts, they have what's called the Rivera Court. Uh, it's an uh, uh, inside courtyard that was, uh, has uh, what's called the Detroit in, uh, Industry Murals that were painted by my countryman, Diego Rivera, which is absolutely fantastic. Obviously, this does not convey the size of this thing, but it's uh, about um, auto workers. So the joke in my group is that um, the Cisneros group uh, works hard, thinks hard, and plays hard. So we'll see if you agree. Okay, so um, to give you an idea of what we do, um, just going to touch on two of the research directions because uh, of time, and obviously I don't want to bore you to death, just half to death, but um, we do a lot of methods development, uh, we, uh, especially on uh, what we call advanced force fields and uh, QMMM simulations, I will explain what QMMM is. We apply these methods to study uh, enzyme reactions, in particular related to DNA repair, and 
is, has been kind of an exciting uh, last couple of months, especially since the announcement of the uh, Chemistry Nobel Prize. In case you guys didn't know, the Chemistry Nobel Prize was awarded to three people that have been working on DNA repair, so that was kind of cool. I didn't get it, but I don't blame them. <laughs> um, I will explain what these blobs are as we go along. Uh, from the work that we've been doing on DNA repair, um, even though I consider myself a, a, a quantum chemist and a computational chemist, um, the work done uh, on, the, on these biological systems actually um, piqued our interest in bioinformatics. So we actually worked a lot on what's called uh, genome-wide association studies and trying to find um, biomarkers or basically things that we can use to uh, see if we can diagnose uh, propensities for disease. Um, we also do a lot of collaborations uh, with an organic and other, uh, well, uh, with other groups. Um, this was a collaboration that was done with Oleg, Sotik uh, Oleg Sotikov, who is now at the University of Kentucky, that uh, involved uh, pyrophosphatase, which is actually similar to the reactions that we've studied in polymerases. So that was one of the uh, things we were able to predict that this uh, residue right here, D89, was responsible, uh, was uh, a big player in catalysis, and then Oleg was able to uh, confirm it experimentally. So that was a nice uh, validation of our predictions. Okay, so actually, I'm not gonna tell you about methods development today. I'm gonna tell you about two um, projects, the reactivity of ALKB family enzymes. I'll tell you what ALKB are, uh, what the ALKB family are, uh, which are involved in the direct repair of alkylated DNA, so they can be methylation, ethylation, synethylation, a bunch of different things. Uh, our particular uh, contribution to this thing has been investigating the rate limiting step and finding some uh, residues that are important for catalysis based on our research. And also, we've been able to propose an alternative mechanism or an alternative pathway for a uh, part of the reaction mechanism. I will also tell you about the cancer biomarkers, but let me start with this reactivity. Okay, so why are we interested in DNA damage and repair? It turns out that uh, everyone gets the DNA in their cells damaged every day. There's roughly 10,000 damaging events per day that happen to DNA, and these can have big impact. Um, damage can come from a whole host of different sources, so just what we would call uh, endogenous sources like cellular metabolism, infection, radiation, et cetera, et cetera. So think about it this way. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the prices, uh, what, one of the reasons why um, uh, Lindahl won the, uh, the, the, was, uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2015 was because he figured out that um, the way that cells uh, fix UV radiation damage, okay? Um, chemical exposure, replication errors, et cetera, et cetera. And once the DNA gets damaged, then the cell has several different uh, options to fix it or kill itself, right? So that would be apoptosis. It can repair the DNA. It can uh, activate transcription to uh, replicate uh, the DNA and try to fix it that way or just checkpoint the cell cycle. Okay, well, if you go to Amazon, it turns out that you can actually buy DNA repair cream. So why would we even care? Uh, not really, right? I mean, you can buy it, but it doesn't mean it works. So it, they haven't quite put us out of business yet. Okay, so DNA alkylation. There's, like I said, many different ways that DNA can get damaged. We are particularly interested in DNA alkylation. So like, like I said, you can be methylation, you can, uh, you can have ethyno ad adducts, uh, ethyno A, et cetera, et cetera. So these are all, <laughs> excuse me, different damages that can be, uh, that can occur that are deleterious on DNA. Um, it can be a cause by either endogenous or exogenous agents, so stuff that is produced within the cell can methylate or uh, ethylate DNA, or stuff that you in ingest can also do it. Uh, because of this, depending on where it is, um, it can basically mess with the pairing of the bases in the DNA, and when the DNA polymerases are coming and replicating, they can actually uh, put in the wrong DNA and that will lead to what, would, what we would call a single point mutation, right? Um, so this could have mutagenic or cytotoxic consequences. And the alkylation can be repaired by various means. Uh, base excision repair, that was the, the, one of the other mechanisms that uh, was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize. Um, the mechanism that we're interested in for DNA repair is called direct repair. And uh, that's because ALP is an enzyme that does a direct repair of uh, 
um, alkylated nucleobases. ALKB is what's called the tidal enzyme of the ALKB family. It's an E. coli enzyme. There's nine human homologs, ALKB H1 through 8 and FTO. And it turns out that all of these homologs can uh, have a whole range of different substrates. They can dealkylate double-stranded DNA, single-stranded DNA, <coughs> RNA, and uh, in, I think it's ALKBH7, it's actually uh, uh, postulated that even um, uh, proteins. So they have a very wide range of substrates. The crystal structure of ALKB is kind of interesting. It's what's called a jelly roll fold. The active site is composed of a non-heme iron that is uh, complexed by two histidines and an aspartate, and it uses two cofactors, alpha ketoglutarate and oxygen. So ALP is part of the superfamily called alpha KG and iron-dependent oxidases. Um, and basically what ALP does is it uses molecular oxygen to catalyze an oxidative dealkylation of the DNA. So the crystal structure that I'm showing here shows a trinucleotide with the middle base flipped in. The middle base is damaged. This is one methyl adenine. This is the methyl right here. And what ALP does is basically just oxidize this methyl so that it can fall away. Okay? Um, the alpha KG uh, and iron dependent superfamily has been studied um, extensively. The tidal enzyme of the whole superfamily is tau D. So the reaction mechanism proposed from that superfamily goes as follows. And um, uh, if you're not interested in mechanisms, um, <coughs> excuse me, you can fall asleep now and I'll wake you up when, you're, when we're ready. Okay, so you start with an iron 2 that is basically unloaded in the active site. The DNA, the damaged base is loaded in alpha ketoglutarate. And then molecular oxygen comes in, oxidizes iron to iron 3 to form this superoxo um, species, which will oxidize um, alpha ketoglutarate to form succinate. Right down here, you release CO2. And in the process, you also oxidize iron to iron 4. And you form this iron 4 oxo or ferrule intermediate. And this is the key intermediate which catalyzes the rate limiting step in the reaction. The rate limiting step consists of, this, in this second phase, uh, this is what will oxidize, in this case, the methyl on 1MA. One, uh, one it will abstract a hydrogen from the methyl to form this iron 3 hydroxyl. And then what has been proposed uh, from uh, analogous enzymes is that you get what's called a rebound mechanism. The OH will come back to the radical center and form this very unstable intermediate, which disproportionates into formaldehyde and the free base. And then you can complete the cycle again. So what we're interested in is this bottom part of the reaction, the second phase, and we're interested in the rate limiting step, as I said. Okay, why are we interested in this? Well, um, we're masochists in, in, uh, compu in, computer, uh, in uh, computational chemistry. Whenever you have a transition metal, you're looking at uh, empty uh, orbitals in the D shell, right? And that's really hard to do with uh, computational chemistry, but we try anyway. Um, I'll be at DFT, so there's obviously issues there. <laughs> but bear with me, and hopefully I'll convince you that semi-qualitatively we get a decent answer. So uh, what are the possible uh, spin, uh, the spins of iron? In this case, iron has four electrons. It's, uh, the, like we said, it's an iron four oxyl. So we have 5D orbitals and one um, uh, S orbital of the oxygen. So if you do just regular alpha, you could think about a quintet or triplet or even a septet state. Uh, we actually did calculate the septet, but that is, that is way too high in energy. From Mussbauer and EPR spectroscopy, they know actually in alpha that the quintet state is the most stable state. But we just did a triplet for, uh, for completeness. It turns out that uh, from calculations uh, back then when we started in model systems and also from um, EPR studies and uh, uh, QMMM on other related enzymes, um, what was found was that uh, as the reaction progresses before the hydrogen is abstracted, the oxygen transfers an electron to the iron manifold. Okay? And then you have two possibilities because you can have an AF coupled iron 3 or an F coupled iron 3. Okay? So if, an, if it's an uh, antiferromagnetically coupled, then your iron is in a high spin state, and that's what I will call it. Okay, so this is a high spin quintet, and if it's uh, an uh, F coupled, it's an intermediate spin quintet. Okay, or you, you can have the analogous uh, high spin and intermediate spin triplets. Okay, so because of this, um, 
uh, Sasson Sheikh, who's in Israel, who's done a lot of work on uh, enzymes uh, related to this and, uh, and uh, model complexes. Um, obviously, these two orbitals are different. This is a pi star orbital. This is a sigma star orbital. So he called these, um, depending on what um, orbital gets populated or what orbital gets the electron, um, he called it either the pi channel or the sigma channel for the reaction. So we had to study these, uh, all these uh, possibilities, okay? So now let me tell you a little bit about QMMM. And uh, when people say that uh, when you're a scientist, you're standing in the shoulders of giants, I already told you that I'm standing on the shoulders of all the people that just won the Nobel Prize for DNA repair. Turns out that QMMM was also a uh, reason for a Nobel Prize in 2013, so that was also kind of cool. So double giants there. Um, the reason why we do QMMM and what, is, what it means is that um, when we're trying to simulate in the computer systems that have many thousands of atoms, such as an enzyme uh, embedded in a, in a solvent, we're, we're talking about, well, now tens to hundreds of thousands of atoms, sometimes a million, um, we have to make approximations that generally preclude us from making, uh, for, uh, from making reactions, okay? But if we go to quantum mechanics, we actually have access to the electronic structure we can simulate reactions, we, can, we know, uh, well, approximately where electrons are. Um, but even with the state of the art, linear scaling DFT, we still not get too much higher than 5,000 atoms. So how do we calculate reactions and enzymes? Well, we kind of chop and change, literally compromise. We combine both, we call it QMMM, so quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics. And the idea is, if you have uh, the reaction happening in the active site, which is a relatively small part generally, um, for example, then you will treat that part quantum mechanically, and then everything else, you do it classically, and then you have them talk to each other, okay? So this method was proposed by Warshell, Levitt, and Karplus, who won the 2013 Nobel Prize, and you can use it for a bunch of different things. We use it for reaction mechanisms, but there's a bunch of other applications. Sherry Parks here in the audience has used it for some other really cool things, um, and well, this is obviously dated now, but uh, there's actually several hundred examples now of QMMM applications. Um, still not quite bo uh, black box though. Anyway, so um, in our particular case, our QM subsystem for, uh, includes the, uh, obviously the coordination shell, uh, the first coordination shell of iron, the oxygen, the damaged base, and then here um, uh, denoting where we're cutting the uh, QM subsystem uh, and uh, linking it to the MM with these pseudobonds um, that were developed in the uh, lab of my former PhD advisor, Wei Tao Yang. Um, so we have six, well, actually we increased it. It's uh, actually 72 atoms. I will tell you uh, in a little bit why, but total we have almost 45,000 atoms. The program of choice that we use is a Gaussian 09 coupled to Tinker. Uh, this is an in-house program that we developed. And I'm gonna go kind of quick over the uh, methodology. If you have questions, I will be happy to answer them. But basically, we take the structure, we run dynamics, make sure that uh, there's no funky stuff going on with the crystal. Uh, and then uh, to calculate the actual reaction, we do the uh, QMMM optimization of what we would call the reactant and the product structures. So basically, it would be, this would be the reactant and then the hydrogen over on this oxygen, that would be our product. And then we use what's called a chain of, repli uh, chain of, repli uh, chain of replica methods, excuse me. Um, there's several different methods to do this, but the idea is that you're gonna have a bunch of points that connect your reactant and your product, and you can optimize all of them together. And this is obviously comput computationally more efficient, and it will allow you to explore the potential energy surface uh, more efficiently too. Uh, the flavor that we like is called quadratic string method, QSM. Um, and then, since it doesn't uh, do an uh, explicit transition state optimizer, we can optimize the transition state too. Once we have the potential energy, we can calculate the associated free energy, and this will allow us to get entropic and enthalpic effects, which sometimes are really important. Um, and then, one thing that we have uh, contributed to the community is uh, what we uh, call uh, quantum interpretative techniques. So, since we have this very complicated electronic structure going on, uh, conventionally, what we do would be to just look at the orbitals. And there's many ways that you can do this. You could just look at the canonical orbitals that you get literally from your uh, quantum program, or you could do localization, and there's many, many different ways to do this localization um, by orthogonal analysis, et cetera, et cetera. But figuring out the orbitals, sometimes it's kind of hard. 
So what we'd like to do is use these interpretative techniques uh, called electron localization function, or ELF, and non-covalent interaction analysis. In addition to that, we can also do some other qualitative uh, analysis to get more information on the biology, as I will explain momentarily. Okay, so since many people are, uh, are not very familiar with these uh, quantum interpretative techniques, let me take a couple of minutes to explain what they are, okay? So ELF, or electron localization function, is based on the conditional probability density of finding two electrons of the same spin at a given distance. So basically you look for every alpha electron that is close to another alpha electron, and then you do the same for the beta electrons, okay? And you put these two together. And what this is gonna tell you is where the electron pairs are, approximately, okay? So if you have this, then you can get what, uh, for example, for the inorganic chemist, what uh, this might sound familiar, the VSCPR, Gillespie's VSCPR um, uh, technique. So um, basically what you get is, uh, after you do uh, what's called a topological analysis, so you take the derivative of this quantity, of this uh, conditional probability density of the spins, and you get regions of density accu of electron accumulation, okay? So for example, here, this is a water molecule, and you have density that is accumulated on the oxygen, and then density that is accu accumulated on this bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, on this other bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen, and then the two lone pairs, right? So similar to Lewis, um, 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 if you were doing a general chemistry uh, uh, Lewis uh, pair analysis, it's the exact same thing, we just do it in the computer, okay? So we get the bunny ears and all that stuff. Uh, the cool thing about this, what I really, really like, is that you can, uh, we actually know where these surfaces are bounded, so we can integrate the electron density on these, so we know how many electrons there are. So for example, if we integrate these, we know there's eight, um, there's six electrons on this core basin of the oxygen, two electrons here, two electrons here, uh, one for the hydrogen, one for the oxygen, and then there's two electrons, uh, sorry, there's four electrons here, two electrons and two electrons, so combined, you get the 10 electrons of the overall molecule, okay? Um, NCI is a qualitative uh, way of visualizing the non-bonded interactions. So ELF will tell us about the bonded interactions. ELF will tell us about the non-bonded interactions. So non-bonded interactions will be hydrogen bonds, pi pi stacking, et cetera, et cetera, okay? And it uh, comes from uh, DFT. It basically is uh, the relation between the electron density and the density gradient or in, well, in DFT parlance is called reduced density gradient. It's just the delta G multiplied by four thirds. <laughs> um, and ba uh, you take the Hessian of this quantity too. And basically, if you think about uh, the density just as being a, a scalar, if you take the derivative of the density where there's a lot of density, for example, at the, uh, at the centers of the, uh, of the atoms, at the nuclei, you're gonna get a maximum of density. Right, <clears throat> so the, the the derivative of the de of the of the density will tell you what where that is. It turns out that if you look at the density and the, the derivative of the density in between regions uh, where you would expect non-covalent interaction, like a hydrogen bond, you also get a tiny bit of density accumulation. So this is a way to figure out where those, that density accumulation is. Okay, and then this Hessian thing that's just to color the surfaces. Um, to denote if it's an attractive interaction, like here we have two double bonds, so we have these two blue surfaces. So blue in, uh, denotes an attractive interaction. As you will see in a little bit, green is just a weak interaction. It could be either positive, uh, attractive or repulsive, and red will be a, a repulsive interaction, okay? So um, my collaborator, uh, collaborator Jean-Philippe Picmal, came up with the idea of combining these two, so now you have uh, information on the bonds, information on the non-covalent interactions, in, why don't we apply it to reactions? So they first uh, applied it to organic reactions and what they found was actually kind of interesting because what turns out is that um, without having to find the actual transition state, when you combine these two, you can actually predict where the transition state is gonna be, which is really useful when you're looking at organic reactions. And what we did was, okay, can we do the same thing for biology? So we uh, extended this to QMMM and uh, I will show you one example of what uh, we can do with this. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So this is the structure of the optimized reactant um, after everything was said and done. The iron is here, kind of pinkish. We have a water molecule to complete the octahedral 
coordination sphere, we have the oxygen of the fer uh, feral um, moiety. Here's the hydrogen that will get abstracted. And it turns out that we found that this water was crucial to put in the QM uh, because this water will have to move out of the way, as you will see in a minute, uh, for the reaction mechanism. Um, interestingly, what we found was that um, when we optimized the reaction, it didn't matter what we did, the wave function always went to the intermediate spin iron 3 oxyl. So that means that the oxygen passed the electron to the iron in the reactant state. It was not along the reaction coordinate. Okay? Uh, keep that in mind because that's actually uh, the, that actually comes into play here. So this is the reaction profile uh, in all the different uh, spin configurations. There's a lot of information. Let me walk you through it. So each one of these lines denotes a reaction path on the particular spin <coughs> excuse me, configuration. So black is the intermediate spin quintet. Red is the uh, high spin quintet. And then blue and purple are the triplets. Okay? These numbers over here correspond to the spin densities on the key atoms in the reaction. So the iron and the oxygen of the ferrule, the hydrogen that's getting abstracted, and the carbon that will become the radical. Okay? So these numbers correspond to the reactant, and these to the transition state and the product, okay? If we're looking just at that step. So you start, we start in the reactant in the, high, uh, in the intermediate spin, so the F-coupled uh, quintet. As the reaction progresses, there seems to be an intersystem crossing to the high spin state, and that will get you to the lowest transition state with a barrier of around 22 kcals in the potential energy surface, and then you drop down to the intermediate in the same high spin quintet, okay? And as you can see here, um, as the reaction continues, we do see a nice radical forming on the carbon, and the hydrogen does transfer as a hydrogen, okay? So, obviously, when we get this, the question is, do we really have an intersystem crossing? Obviously, this is DFT, so it's a single reference calculation. There's a lot of issues with what I'm going to show you next, but it's a qualitative approximation. If we have 72 atoms in the active, uh, in the active site, it's going to be hard to do any multi-reference, which is what we would really have to do. Right? Okay. But what Dong did was, uh, that was, I think, kind of cool, was he figured out that um, if we're trying to figure out where that crossing is, what happened was uh, we see that the iron-oxygen bond actually stretches. And as the iron-oxygen bond stretches, you can imagine this is going to affect the orbital manifold. And that does the energetics of, of the orbitals in the iron and oxygen manifold. So what he did was he started um, with the same... Um, structure, in this case around 1.62 angstroms, uh, and calculated the same state, uh, well, the, the same structure with the two different spin states. And then he just stepped along this coordinate of the iron oxygen for both. And what he found was that around 1.75 angstroms, the two basically coalesce. That's the definition of a minimum energy crossing point that two surfaces cross. So since we have Bernie Schlegel literally right down, the, uh, right down the hall, he has a lot of different optimization techniques. He can optimize these things, which was kind of cool. So he has a Mathematica notebook that can actually optimize conical intersections and uh, seams, minimum energy crossing points. So we took his uh, Mathematica notebook um, and cajoled it for QMMM, and we were able to guesstimate where the minimum energy crossing point is. Uh, but interestingly, it's actually kind of close to what you would expect the uh, um, high spin uh, reactant to be, okay? So once we have this information, then we can uh, figure out where the MECP is and complete the whole potential energy surface, and then we can do free energy probation off this. So when everything is said and done, and we do the free energy from the MM and uh, harmonic approximation on the QM, we get a barrier of around 18.6 kcals per mole after we take into account the... Uh, thermal effect. So um, this 18.6 kcal per mole en uh, barrier is consistent with what you would uh, assume from the experiment. So the kcat is around uh, something like 0.1 per minute, which corresponds to 19.8 kcal per mole. So we're well within uh, 2 kcals whenever anyone, well, most people that do QMMM, whenever we get uh, delta of 2 plus minus 2 kcals, we're really happy, right? We assume that the path that we have uh, calculated is representative of the path manifold that you would have for the reaction. And as you can see here, we start 
with uh, uh, re if, uh, the reactant is a reference, we, s we end with an intermediate that is uh, around 6 kcals lower in energy. So it's a nice exothermic reaction, which is what we would expect. Okay, so now let's dig in a little bit more into the electronic structure of this, okay? So this is where this combined ELF and NCI technique came in really, really handy. And all of the, res all of the stuff that I'm gonna tell, uh, tell you about, we actually corroborated with uh, what's called biorthogonal orbital analysis. So we actually did like the hardcore quantum stuff too. But for t presentation and time uh, limits, this is a lot easier to understand, okay? So bear with me. Um, like I said before, the green, blue, and red surfaces correspond to the NCI, so that's the non-covalent interactions. And then these gray uh, volumes or gray, gray blobs correspond to uh, the electron pairs, okay? So this is the hydrogen that gets abstracted. We have the oxygen over here and this is the iron over there. Let's just concentrate on that. If you look at the two images, this is the intermediate spin state, this is the high spin state. So um, these two structures correspond to the minimum energy crossing point. So by definition, the position of the nuclei is exactly the same. The only thing that changes is the wave function, okay? And basically the only thing that changes is where the electron is in which orbital, okay? So as you can see here, if we superpose these two, they're almost exactly the same. If we were to take the difference, we wouldn't see too much of a difference except for this basin over here, okay? So it turns out that in the intermediate spin state, when you have the electron in the sigma, uh, in the, in, in the sigma star uh, orbital, the oxygen actually has two well-defined lone pairs, okay? And we can, take the, uh, uh, we can in integrate the electron density, it's two, two electrons on each, very nice. And we can also do uh, for, since we have the electron density, we can do a Taylor expansion, which would be basically a Buckingham expansion to get the multiples. And when we do that, we basically see that there's not, they're not very polarized, okay? When we go over here, so basically just flipping the electron, um, and we get just one single basin for both, uh, uh, both of the lone pairs, and we do the multiples, it turns out that there's a huge dipole that is pointing straight at the hydrogen. So what this suggested to us is that you need to get that crossing to um, uh, polarize your oxygen so that, it can, so that it's primed to accept the electron that is gonna come with that hydrogen, okay? So now let me go over here, and this is, um, this is gonna be a little movie. What you're gonna see is that the water is gonna move out of the way. It's forming a, hydrogen, a strong hydrogen bond with this oxygen over here. So you have to break that hydrogen bond so that you can start stretching the iron-oxygen bond. Once the iron-oxygen bond stretches to the minimum energy crossing point, then you cross over. You polarize the oxygen and you will see this hydrogen get uh, sucked by the oxygen and then it will turn over here to form a second hydrogen bond, okay? So let me see if I can find my, there we go. Okay, so water moves, iron oxygen stretches, you polarize, the hydrogen, uh, the transition state is right there. So it's a shared bond between the oxygen, hydrogen, and carbon. We can actually quantify it. It's a three center bond, which we can calculate with the ELF. And then we go down to the product well, uh, and part of the stabilization is explained by this very strong hydrogen, second hydrogen bond that is formed, okay? One more thing that we can do is uh, try to figure out the residues around the active site, and actually the waters, but we didn't do that uh, in this case, they weren't too important, but the residues around the active site, how they interact with the reactant and with the transition state. And if we take the difference between these two, um, we can get an idea of if the, the residues stabilize or destabilize this transition state, okay? And this can be loosely correlated with uh, experimental mutagenesis data, okay? This is, again, very qualitative. It only involves approximating the interactions as Coulomb and Van der Waals from the force field. So um, take these numbers with a grain of salt, so we're just basically looking for trends. Um, so we predicted, um, nine different residues in the active site, and these two, uh, which is kind of, uh, well, kind of makes sense, these are the other two um, nucleotides and the trinucleotide. Experimentally, Tom Hollis, actually down, the, um, down I-40 at uh, Wake Forest, did uh, the mutagenesis, and what, uh, what he had reported previously was that uh, threonine and tyrosine indeed are catalytically important. Um, so that was nice validation of our analysis, and we have the same trend 
like I said, we're not aiming for the, uh, for, uh, for the same numbers. If we were, I would actually be very worried because it's a very qualitative analysis. Uh, the uh, interesting one was this arginine 161, which we are predicting to have a big impact on catalysis, but experimentally m makes no difference, right? So the question is what's going on there? Um, this arginine 161 is this residue right here, which forms a very strong salt bridge with the backbone phosphate of the 1MA. And it turns out that um, after we had published this analysis, the, uh, the year after, there was another crystal structure of ALP that was published that showed that this loop where the arginine sits is actually in a very close contact crystallogra uh, crystallographically with another unit. And so actually the position of this loop, and this is a very mobile loop apparently, um, so the position in the crystal structure that we chose appears to be um, not correct. And since we didn't run too long of a uh, dynamic simulation, we only run 10 nanoseconds, what my suspicion is, is that this uh, salt bridge is basically just an artifact of the crystal structure that we chose in the, in the short simulation. So uh, if we were to run longer, I would expect that to break in. So that's another thing that we need to check. Um, okay, going more to the biology, the question is, all the stuff that we have predicted is for this um, bacterial enzyme, E. coli, right? But like I said, there's eight, uh, well, actually nine human homologs, and evolution is just not for nothing, right? The question is, do any of the residues that we have predicted to be important for catalysis um, actually appear in the human homologs? Lo and behold, they actually do. So this is a structure and, function, uh, the structure and sequence alignment. And out of the nine residues that we found, there's five in a ABH2 that are structurally conserved basically same location. The RMSD here is less than 0.5 angstroms, which is kind of cool. Uh, in ABH3, there's seven of the nine. And so this is basically trying to bait the experimentalist to do the mutagenesis on the, uh, on the, uh, yeah, on the human uh, enzymes, right? So hopefully someone will pick it up because I think that would be really cool. Okay, um, let me switch a little bit gears and uh, tell you about uh, the alternative pathways after the hydrogen abstraction. So like I told you, there's uh, two stages of the reaction. The first is basically oxidizing the iron. The second is oxidizing the methyl. The optimal pH for one methyl adenine is relatively basic. Um, and this is the other crystal structure I was telling you about of alkyl with one methyl A and succinate. And in this paper, what they had suggested is that this uh, red ball here, which corresponds to an oxygen, um, they didn't assign it as a water, they assigned it as an OH. Resolution does not allow for the discrimination of the hydrogen, so I'm not gonna get into details because I'm not a crystallographer. But um, we thought it was interesting. So what we did, um, oh, before I go on, uh, let me explain another interesting fact that came out of the uh, alternative mechanism for tau from uh, one of our collaborators, Bob Hausinger at MSU. So from time resolve Raman, what uh, they proposed this mechanism. So this is a similar mechanism of tau for um, uh, for the decomposition of taurine. And what they find in the intermediate after the hydrogen has been, uh, uh, has been abstracted, uh, when in this case it's not an OH, it's, it's uh, kind of like an O minus, um, that uh, instead of rebounding all the way to the site of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the radical, you actually have a shared bond between the carbon and the iron. And this was uh, assigned because of this uh, time resolved Brahma. So, the question is, does this happen in ALP? So what we decided to do is we already had the uh, uh, mechanism with this water, so we replaced that with an OH minus. I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. Suffice it to say that we did calculate every single intermediate in the transition state along all of these uh, different steps, both for the water and for the OH minus. All that is published. If you're interested, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy to tell you more about it. But let me just show you that basically when we put OH minus in, uh, in uh, so the hydroxyl instead of water, we get basically the same picture that we had before, same numbers, almost exactly. Um, and then after you have uh, gotten that hydrogen transferred, you have to rebound the uh, hydroxyl to the, uh, to the center, to the side of the carbon. And that's also nice and exothermic. And that's what we call I2, okay? So the hydroxyl rebound with water, it's only an 8.5 bar uh, kcal barrier, so that's much lower than the rate limiting step, which is what we would expect. With the OH, it can be either uh, stepwise or considered mechanism, um, and that is uh, roughly 13 kcals higher 
um, and, but it's much more uh, stable in, uh, in, in the second intermediate. Um, one thing that was interesting, if we do this for either the water or the OH minus, uh, and we do the uh, NCI analysis, we see this really um, dark blue uh, surface between the iron and the oxygen, which denotes a uh, significant interaction between the oxygen and the iron, which is consistent with what, which, with what would be a coordination bond between those two atoms. So this is uh, suggestive of what uh, Bob Hausinger had proposed from the time result of Raman. Okay? <clears throat> Um, I'm not going to go through all the details. Turns out that if we uh, form this uh, formaldehyde with water, uh, the barriers are actually higher than the rate limiting step. So both of these barriers in, uh, are around 25 to 26 kcal per mole. Um, if we were to move the hydrogen of that OH, mi uh, OH minus that gets rebounded to a different substrate, uh, so, sorry, a, a different general base, in this case a glutamate through a water, uh, the barrier is significantly reduced. The problem is that water that needs to be there for the shuttle uh, only shows partial occupancy, both in the crystal and in our simulations. So we think this is a likely uh, path uh, when the water is there. But since the water is not there consistently, then um, um, this path is not accessible all the time. Okay? Conversely, if we're in a basic pH, so we have OH minus in the active site, then from I2 to the product is a straight shot with a very small barrier. So what we concluded from this was that the OH minus uh, pathway that had not been proposed before might be more likely due to in this particular enzyme. Okay, so let me summarize all the mess that I just told you. So the minimum energy path of the rate limiting step involves a crossing between the intermediate spin quintet and the high spin quintet. We found nine residues that are catalytically important and are conserved in ABH2 and ABH3. The reactant for the rate limiting step involves an iron three, uh, uh, in, in, uh, intermediate spin iron 3 oxyl. After we published this, and um, there's been several other studies on ALF-B and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, uh, an, uh, a MOF, a metal organic framework that actually catalyzes the same reaction is really interesting. Um, they did the uh, spin analysis in this JAX paper and then CH, the CEJ paper. They actually still call it an iron 4 oxo, which for reasons I don't really quite understand. But when you look at the spin densities, it's clear that the electron has been transferred to the iron in the reactant. Um, this MOF paper in JAX that was published, uh, uh, it was a collaboration with Julia Galli and uh, Don Trular. They actually did multi-reference calculations and did the spin analysis on the multi-reference wave function, and the numbers are almost exactly the same. It's just it's remarkable. I thought it was really cool. Um, and the last thing is uh, we uh, uh, hypothesized that the hydroxyl pathway is preferred and might explain the basic optimal pH for the repair of this particular substrate. Okay? Now, this is all uh, in terms of the QMMM. Now let me uh, switch a little bit of gears and go to cancer biomarkers. But before I do that, uh, let me explain why I got interested in that, okay? So um, when I was a postdoc, I was working on DNA polymerases. The enzyme that I uh, focused uh, on was uh, called DNA polymerase lambda. The reaction that the polymerases catalyze is uh, basically adding nucleotides onto the DNA chain. So you have the template DNA here. This is what's called the primer and the rest of the chain goes that way and you're adding DNA that way, okay? There's two metals in the active site, in this case magnesium. I'm not gonna show you too much more of that, but basically we did the same stuff that I just showed you, QMMM, right? We got the reaction mechanism, all was very nice, and we predicted a bunch of residues around the active site. Since I was at a, the, an institute of the NIH, there's a lot of biologists and a lot of uh, structural biologists, so there's a lot of biology being uh, talked about. So the question is, do these actually <coughs> are conserved with other polymerases? So polymerases are separated into five different families. Uh, pol, pol lambda belongs to the X family. So we aligned the sequences of the X family polymerases and what we found is that of the seven residues that we predicted, um, almost all are either totally or partially conserved. That means that they are exactly in the same positions and they're, they're the same residues, okay? Um, <clears throat> later on, what I decided, what I started wondering is, well, if these residues are there, they might be there for a reason and they might be there in the rest of the polymerases because the, react the, the active side of the polymerases is strikingly similar, 
for all of them. So there's 18 different human polymerases. All of these are their names. It's not important right now. Turns out that of the seven residues that we predicted, five are either partially or totally conserved. Okay? So then uh, what I started questioning was, what happens if by some uh, accident or some natural selection or whatever, there's some mutation at the gene level. So basically just m mutating um, one nucleotide for another, that's called a single nucleotide polymorphism, that is, <coughs> that codes for the region of that particular uh, uh, residue in the protein product, would that affect um, the, uh, would that give rise to a disease? So the hypothesis is, if we have individuals that have a SNP on a DNA polymerase gene that has, this is the biologically, like what NIH would like, the functional impact on the protein product are likely to have a predisposition toward cancer. Let me translate that. That just means if you mess up the gene and after it's translated, it goes to the protein and you mutate one of these residues around the active site, would that help you in uh, predicting cancer, right? Okay, so what we did was, um, this was work that was done by Rebecca. Uh, she did an awesome job. She developed an algorithm and software to search for any SNP on any gene that we wanted. And then, once we have this SNP, we do a statistical analysis to make sure that it's actually significant. And also, if it falls on a protein and it mutates the protein, we can do MD and look at what's going on, okay? So, let me tell you uh, how we actually do this. Um, this is what, um, this comes from what's called generally the genome-wide association studies. And due to the now low cost of uh, full genome sequencing, what uh, people have been doing for a while is um, trying to figure out if you can, excuse me, find out what's called biomarkers. So these um, uh, different uh, reporters that come out from uh, people that have a certain disease that would not appear in the general healthy population, okay? There's many different biomarkers. It could be a metabolite, it could be a uh, uh, lack of a protein, it could be many, many different things. One possible reporter would be this uh, single nucleotide polymorphism, okay? So, uh, and that's a really easy thing to search for when you're doing these genome-wide association studies because when you're genotyping, you can actually figure out what's the sequence of the entire genome and then you compare it, okay? So that's what people do. They get a phenotype, that's just a fancy name for a disease. So you get a bunch of people that have that disease for let's say 2,000 people that have prostate cancer, okay? And then you sequence their entire genome. You do the same thing with 2,000 people that are healthy, that don't have uh, prostate cancer. You do this on what's called a, uh, a chip, a chip seek. Um, and then you compare these two, okay? The thing is, when you're doing the genome sequencing, you're looking at 3 billion base pairs, right? Times 4,000. So you're looking at a huge amount of data, right? So when you're doing this comparison, what you're trying to do is pick out literally a needle in a universal haystack, right? It's huge. Um, but um, what you're trying to figure out is if the differences that you find are found in, let's say, 70% of the patients and 0% ideally of the non-patients, because then that would mean that's statistically significant. That only appears in the patient population, right? Um, but when you're doing this for 3 billion base pairs, it's very hard. So even though uh, literally hundreds of GWAS have been done over uh, now almost a decade, only, I think, three SNPs have been found. So literally millions of dollars have been spent on doing this and uh, the return on investment hasn't been that good, okay? So what we decided to do was um, take a, a step back. So let me tell you what uh, the possible outcomes are for the SNPs. This is, um, this is related to uh, the central dogma of biology that you have DNA transferred to, uh, uh, and you go to RNA and then RNA gets translated to protein, okay? So if you have your DNA, higher eukaryotes have what's called introns and exons, okay? And this is what gives rise to the diversity that we have compared to like archaea and all that stuff. And that's because of this what's called altern alternative splicing. So basically, after you form the, uh, the uh, mRNA, the messenger RNA, it actually gets uh, chopped up and you take out all of, the, um, um, all of the introns and then put together all of the exons, okay? So you can imagine that if you have a mutation at a particular site on your gene, it could fall either on an intron or an exon, okay? If it falls on an intron, then it gets chopped away. 
And there's some interesting thing that can happen there, but we're not looking at that right now. If it falls on an exon, then you can have two possibilities, okay? Since uh, the codons that code from uh, gene to protein are triples of nucleotides, then you have repeated codons, okay? So it turns out that you can have a mutation on a codon that codes for the exact same uh, residue in the protein, okay? So that's called a synonymous SNP, okay? That would be this green one that gets translated and then you get the exact same protein, hopefully. We'll not get into that. Um, if you have a non-synonymous SNP, that basically means it will affect the final product, it will mutate the protein, okay? That's a non-synonymous SNP, and that's what we're interested in right now. So what we do is kind of what uh, people that when the field of bioinformatics and biostatistics started is uh, what we're doing. Instead of having the information of the whole genome, what people had what, uh, was uh, genomic information of very small genes, and what people said was, okay, I kind of have a hunch that uh, this particular protein might be involved in, I don't know, lupus. So let's go see if we can find something there, okay? So it's the same idea uh, that we had. So we stand at the comparison stage, um, but what we're doing is we're using information already known from biochemistry and molecular biology of the relationships or suspected relationships of proteins, in this case DNA polymerases to cancer. So if you think about it this way, if the polymerase makes a mistake and it introduces a mutation on a gene, this could lead to cancer, okay? That was our initial hypothesis. So if we get a bunch of these genome-wide association studies, or GWAS, a bunch of these databases, and then start looking for SNPs just for that particular gene, then we reduce the search size a lot, right? So let me show you how much. So we get, uh, we select our gene of interest, in this case all the polymerases, we put them in a searchable form, we search for SNPs, and then we do statistical analysis and track the structure. So the first example that we did was on polymerases, we took 12 cancer studies, that's nine different cancers because there's the repeated studies, so for example, there's two pancreatic cancer studies, two prostate, two breast, et cetera, okay? So that is 7.4 million SNPs just on those genes, okay? And then, sorry, just on, uh, on those 12 studies. Um, we apply our method that we call uh, hypothesis-driven SNP search or hidden SNPs. We whittle down from 7.4 million to 2,500. This includes intronic and exonic. And then we just uh, ask if they're exonic, and then we uh, ask if they're non-synonymous, okay? So after this whole uh, mess, we come up with a much smaller SNP universe. Uh, these are uh, just a sample of the SNPs that we found. We found 79 statistically significant SNPs for four different cancer phenotypes. So we found uh, SNPs for lung, breast, prostate, and melanoma that are statistically significant. So that means that they are found much more prevalently in patients than non-patients. Um, what to me is more interesting is that since we now have very, a very small number of SNPs, we can actually start uh, uh, questioning what happens if you actually have two SNPs or three SNPs at the same time. So basically looking at the correlations, right? Um, geneticists, uh, oh, all of these were previously overlooked. Uh, geneticists call uh, this correlations haplotypes. So we found that a haplotype from two SNPs on Paul Lambda, which is my pet enzyme, uh, gives a threefold risk cancer, a threefold increase risk for breast cancer. Um, a haplotype uh, from three SNPs on Paul Gamma, Paul Gamma is a mitochondrial DNA polymerase, gives a ninefold risk increase for prostate cancer. This is a very um, rare uh, haplotype, but it's still, uh, uh, it's still a huge reporter, so we're trying to investigate with uh, uh, Cancer Center if this might be something that uh, uh, would be useful. Um, but obviously, like I said, we're also interested in what is the effect of these SNPs. So uh, several of these SNPs are not exonic non-synonymous. So for example, in Pol Beta, there's five different SNPs. Uh, on Pol Delta, which is the main replicative polymerase in, uh, in humans, Pol Delta and Pol Epsilon, uh, there's five SNPs. Um, and like I said, there's a couple of SNPs in Pol Lambda. So since we know Pol Lambda, what we did was try to figure out what that SNP does. So it turns out that um, that, uh, that mutation, that SNP, is a mutation of ARG438 to a tyrosine. And this arginine is relatively close to this loop one in the structure. Okay, so it's between, as you will see, uh, 12 to 14 angstroms. This loop one 
is critical for the fidelity of pole lambda. So if you mess with this uh, loop, you don't kill the enzyme, you just make it really unfaithful. So that means that it will start putting a lot of uh, in, um, incorrect base pairs, okay? Um, also, if you, mess with, uh, if you mess with this mutation here, um, you get a bunch of cuts on the DNA. DNA polymerase lambda fixes double-stranded breaks in DNA. So if you break the DNA, then the chromosomes will actually just break apart, depending on where the cut happens. Um, so what we did was try to figure out if, there was, if this had anything to do with the dynamics of the protein. So uh, we l uh, did a cr what's called a cross-correlation analysis, so basically looking at how the residues move. Uh, when you do dynamics, we looked at the, what's called the binary system, so the protein plus DNA, or the ternary system, the protein plus DNA plus the incoming nucleotide in the wild type and mutant structures. Um, and then we looked at, um, we did this correlation analysis, uh, which basically gives you a matrix, and this just shows how each residue is correlated with every other residue, so basically how it moves, okay? Uh, these are the difference plots, so this is the difference between the wild type and mutant in the binary, and wild type and mutant in the ternary, okay? As you can see here, there's a couple of regions that light up a little bit orange. There's much more over here. So we were interested in this region over here that actually when we mapped it back to the structure corresponds exactly to the correlation of arginine 438 to the motion of the loop, okay? So what we hypothesized was, let me go back here, was that when the mutation uh, happens on this arginine that affects the motion of the loop, which might affect the fidelity. And this remains to be obviously confirmed experimentally. Okay, so more recently, we've done the same thing with ALKB. Uh, so we did hidden SNPs analysis on the, uh, all the human ALKB enzymes just for prostate cancer. We obtained 2,000 SNPs, 79 of those are exonic non-synonymous. Interestingly, approximately 75% of those SNPs are found on FDO. We found one SNP called RS7540, which is statistically significant for prostate cancer, and this was validated in two ways. One is through structure, as I will tell you uh, momentarily. Another was st uh, statistically. So we got this SNP from one prostate cancer database, and then we took another prostate cancer database and did the statistical analysis on that one separately, and that is the statistical validation, okay? Um, the other thing we did was we ran 100 nanoseconds MD on both the wild type and the mutant, so same deal that we did for Paul Lambda. And it turns out that when you do that, you see that there's a huge change in fluctuation and uh, uh, displacement um, that starts here and the active site is all the way over here and there's actually kind of like a chain, you can barely see it, but here in the backbone that will bas basically result in the uh, motion of a histidine that um, um, complexes the iron and that motion, uh, sorry, results in, in the wild type after you start running dynamics because of that motion, the cofactors leave, okay? And we ran the same simulations three different ways, and in all cases, it, uh, the, th the same thing happens. We don't know if this is significant or, or not. We just think it's an interesting result. So there's still a lot of work to do there, okay? So to summarize, uh, we have hidden SNPs, which is a new method to search for the C SNPs. We discovered 79 statistically significant SNPs on four cancer phenotypes. The haplotype analysis provides the first direct link of the two polymerases to the two different cancer types. Um, we investigated the effect of one of these uh, SNPs on Paul Lambda, and uh, we hypothesized that it may affect fidelity. And we've now applied the hidden SNPs on a bunch of other different families. I just told you about ALKB, so hopefully we can get some other information. With that, I'd like to thank the people that did the actual work again. Um, uh, so Dong and Rebecca, Alice is now uh, taking over, and she did all the work on ALKB. Uh, Pavel uh, also did the statistical analysis. <laughs> Excuse me, our collaborations with Bob Housing and Jean-Philippe Picmal were instrumental. Money from NIH. Um, and I'll thank you for your attention and be happy to take questions. In the first part of your talk, you mentioned uh, the, the hydroxyl versus the, the water. Uh -huh. um, did you compute the pKa of that water in the presence of everything? That's a good question. No, we didn't. I mean, um, we know that water actually um, 
we didn't explicitly calculate the pKa, but if we pull the uh, if we pull the hydrogen, it, it it pulls out relatively easily. But pulling the hydrogen and doing the actual pKa calculation, as you know, is <laughs> it's close, but it's not enough. Um, so we think it's um, um, uh, we think it's low, but we don't have the number. And my guess is that. Um, the hydroxyl, if you're in a basic peak, in a base, in a high pH environment, you may have just the hydroxyls and they may come in. We don't know. So. Um, actually, I have a few questions. Uh -huh. So, it's 100 nanosecond MD. Yes. This is atomistic, not coarse grain. That's atomistic. Mm -hmm. With solvent, lots of experience. Yeah, so that's uh, the, total, the total number of that. The, so LPH7 is actually uh, much larger than LP. So the total system size there is 120,000 atoms. But uh, so the reason why we can do that is because of, uh, um, excuse me, uh, GPUs. So we're able, the, running on a one single card, we're able to run uh, 10 nanoseconds per day. Yeah. That's just amber. So it's a yeah, point charge. So it's very basic. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Of everything, enzyme, solvent, everything. Yes, Co yes. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Counter ions, everything. Mm -hmm. So the wave function is polarized, but the system is not polarized. <laughs> My last question is about your spin crossing Uh huh. You want me to go back to them? Okay. Yes. No, that's a really good question. We actually, um, so, no, that's, yeah, we optimized absolutely everything else and we kept for, uh, the iron oxygen uh, distance frozen. So, yes, everything else is, yes. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm glad you have this picture of the electron. Okay. After you get transferred from hydrogen to the ferial oxygen, yes. it seems like the, the methylene radical now. The hydroxyl, the iron hydroxyl, move away from one of them. Yes. So, and, and I know you showed this, but I just didn't quite catch it. So, how do they get back together for the rebound step? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, let me see. Maybe, uh, yeah, this is cycling. So, yes. So, it, I mean, the, yeah, that's that's a very keen eye. Um, that that's a really great question. So, the the uh, the methylene moves out, uh, moves away, but um, it's not a huge, uh, so the distance is around, uh, if, if I remember correctly, and this is a guesstimate, um, it's around, uh, I think like 2.8, maybe three angstroms away. So it's, it, it is considerable, but it's not, yes, exactly, it's not insurmountable. And um, um, the, um, the iron oxygen bond, once you have the, uh, the hydrogen there, since you uh, reduce the iron from iron, for, uh, well, uh, you're, uh, the, promoted the electron to iron, uh, because you started with the iron three, um, then the iron oxygen bond is, n is not super strong. So that's why the barrier to, to go from this intermediate to the second intermediate, what we call I2, is not as big. Simulations um, are they informative for developing therapeutics? That's the uh, well money question, right? Uh, yeah. So um, we hope they would, uh, they will be, because obviously doing the genotyping for one single gene is a lot cheaper than doing genotyping for a full genome, right? I mean, even though full genome now you have it under a thousand dollars, but for a single gene it's in the hundreds or less than hundred. Um, so yes, that's what we're hoping, but um, there still needs to be a lot of validation because um, right now at the stage that we have it, it's just we have the signal that comes from the whole genotyping that we just pull out, but then the question is, is there really um, um, a clinical effect of those uh, mutations? So cell assays and uh, in, in vivo assays like mouse, et cetera, et cetera, would be in order. And that's what basically keeping, uh, what's keeping us from that. 
but I mean, we definitely have, the, would like to go that route. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there suggestive, I mean, so it's an opinion choice. Yes. So are there some places where, for example, there is some uh, idea in some of these myths not to, uh, not to formulate the mutation or whatever, that you could actually say, these are the ones that you can target to get the answer perhaps. Or, I yes. So you, you point out in the paper here, these coordinations with the prostate cancer that have a large prediction. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Yes. There's. No, that's that's a really great question, and um, that uh, has been kind of tricky because that has required us to learn a lot of genetics that we're not obviously trained for, um, and talking with a lot of bi uh, a lot with bioinformaticians, and it turns out that there's one SNP that. Um, there's a lot of information, like indirect information, that uh, tracks it to prostate cancer. We've been concentrating more recently just on prostate cancer. So one of the SNPs that we pulled out from the studies and uh, validated statistically has been reported in several different uh, papers to have uh, this several different effects. So there's a lot of literature that is suggestive that this SNP might be uh, um, a good, well, a possible target to do something like a, predict, uh, a, a predictive uh, diagnostic, right? Um, the thing is, uh, convincing the powers that be at the cancer center or, well, some investigator that has the technology to do, actually do this or has a cohort to actually follow, follow it up because that's what we need. biologists, it seems now that what has to happen is you have to combine clinicians, even though everybody yeah. says that happens, with computational folks at this level, yeah. with statisticians at the, uh, you know, Yeah, so, that, that, so that's exactly what we've been trying to do, but have been so far unsuccessful. And I, we haven't published this in more recent data on RFP, but I think uh, the first time uh, we actually, uh, being completely honest, a lot of clinicians were saying, yeah, th this looks kind of like a just one-off, uh, one-off, and it might just be just completely lucky. And uh, uh, going on that, it's uh, because these are expensive things to run, like uh, generating cell lines or generating mouse models or whatever. Those are really expensive propositions. Um, now with the LP, well, the LBH7, uh, um, I think this... It's interesting that uh, applying the same thing to a di completely different family, we're getting similar uh, things. Um, I think it's starting to get a little bit more suggestive. And that's the reason why we're looking at more than one family. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Ah, that's a really great question. So um, coming from Wei Tao Yang's lab, the first thing that gets beaten into you is you always benchmark functionals, right? So obviously we started with B3LYP because you have to. Well, I have to. <laughs> um, but we tested six different functionals with varying uh, uh, percentage of uh, explicit exchange. So uh, we did Becky half and half, um, B3LYP, B3LYP star, MO6, MO6 to X, uh, MO6 to XL, Omega B97XD, uh, PBE0, and basically we went from 15% exchange to 50% exchange. And the more exchange you get, you actually flip the systems and it gets really weird. Um, so the way we validated the benchmark is we, were, uh, we knew that it had to be a quintet, and we knew that uh, the barrier had to be roughly within 20 to 22 kcals. So that was our criteria. And the only functional that met that criteria was Omega B97 XD. So the 22% exchange and the long range dispersion was crucial for this particular system. But obviously, I mean, that defeats the purpose of DFT, right? I mean, you want to just pick the <laughs> functional and be able to go like if you were doing CCSD, but we can't do that with this. Anything else? All right, that, let's thank our speaker. Thank you. Thanks.